Remembering God's Revelations Monday of the fifth week of Easter I have told you this while I am with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. John 14 verses 25 to 26 Sometimes we forget all that God has spoken to us. For example, we may have some clear experience of God's presence in our lives, such as a powerful spiritual insight gained through prayer, a deep conviction of His voice spoken through a sermon, the transforming freedom encountered through the sacrament of reconciliation, or some form of unmistakable clarity imparted through the reading of the Holy Scriptures. When God speaks to us, imparting His truth, strength, forgiveness, and every other form of grace, we are spiritually consoled as we sense His closeness. But when trouble comes our way, those moments of clarity can be easily lost. The disciples would have had many clarifying experiences during the three years of Jesus' public ministry. They marveled at the spiritual authority they encountered in His sermons, witnessed countless miracles, looked on as sinners were set free, saw Jesus transfigured in glory, and watched our Lord enter deeply into prayer with the Father. Each time they encountered the power of God at work, they would have grown in their conviction that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. But Jesus also knew that these disciples would soon have their faith in Him shaken. He knew that as they looked on from a distance in fear as Jesus was arrested, beaten and killed, they would start to forget all that they previously experienced. Fear can cause confusion, and Jesus knew that his disciples would soon fall into that trap. For this reason, Jesus spoke the words above to his disciples. He promised them that the Holy Spirit would soon come upon them to teach them everything and to remind them all that he told them. How nice it would be if every lesson we ever learned from God remained front and center in our lives. How nice it would be if we never allowed fear to confuse us and cause us to forget all that God has spoken to us in varied ways. Just as Jesus knew the disciples would need the help of the Holy Spirit to remember, He also knows that we need the same help from the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the words spoken to the disciples above are also spoken to us. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. What lessons of faith have you learned in the past that you need to be reminded of? It is the role of the Holy Spirit to bring those lessons to mind every time we need them. Therefore, as we move closer to the glorious celebration of the Solemnity of Pentecost, it is a good time to pray to the Holy Spirit and ask for the gift of remembering the many ways that God has revealed Himself to us. The Father, Son and Holy Spirit work in perfect harmony with each other but each has a distinct role in our lives. The Holy Spirit's role is especially to lead us day by day into the fulfillment of the Father's will of becoming perfectly conformed to the person of Christ Jesus. Reflect, today, upon this powerful promise that our Lord gave to His disciples and to us. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Open yourself to the Spirit's ongoing direction in your life and never allow fear to lead to confusion. Instead, allow God to dispel all confusion and to remind you of all that He has spoken to you throughout your life. Most glorious Lord Jesus, you promised the disciples and all your people that the Holy Spirit would be sent to us to remind us of all that you have revealed. Holy Spirit, please continuously descend upon me, teach me, and guide me. Help me to never forget the many lessons I have been taught so that I will never let fear lead to confusion. Jesus, I trust in you. March 18th, 2024. Monday of the fifth week of Lent. A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. In Babylon there lived a man named Joachim, who married a very beautiful and God-fearing woman, Susanna, the daughter of Hilkiah. Her pious parents had trained their daughter according to the law of Moses. Joachim was very rich, he had a garden near his house, and the Jews had recourse to him often because he was the most respected of them all. That year, two elders of the people were appointed judges, of whom the Lord said, Wickedness has come out of Babylon, from the elders who were to govern the people as judges. These men, to whom all brought their cases, 
frequented the house of Joachim. When the people left at noon, Susanna used to enter her husband's garden for a walk. When the old men saw her enter every day for her walk, they began to lust for her. They suppressed their consciences. They would not allow their eyes to look to heaven and did not keep in mind just judgments. One day, while they were waiting for the right moment, she entered the garden as usual, with two maids only. She decided to bathe, for the weather was warm. Nobody else was there except the two elders, who had hidden themselves and were watching her. Bring me oil and soap, she said to the maids, and shut the garden doors while I bathe. As soon as the maids had left, the two old men got up and hurried to her. Look, they said, the garden doors are shut and no one can see us. Give in to our desire and lie with us. If you refuse, we will testify against you that you dismissed your maids because a young man was here with you. I am completely trapped, Susanna groaned. If I yield, it will be my death. If I refuse, I cannot escape your power. Yet it is better for me to fall into your power without guilt than to sin before the Lord. Then Susanna shrieked, and the old men also shouted at her, as one of them ran to open the garden doors. When the people in the house heard the cries from the garden, they rushed in by the side gate to see what had happened to her. At the accusations by the old men, the servants felt very much ashamed, for never had any such thing been said about Susanna. When the people came to her husband Joachim the next day, the two wicked elders also came, fully determined to put Susanna to death. Before all the people they ordered, send for Susanna, the daughter of Helkiah, the wife of Joachim. When she was sent for, she came with her parents, children, and all her relatives. All her relatives and the onlookers were weeping. In the midst of the people, the two elders rose up and laid their hands on her head. Through tears she looked up to heaven, for she trusted in the Lord wholeheartedly. The elders made this accusation. As we were walking in the garden alone, this woman entered with two girls and shut the doors of the garden, dismissing the girls. A young man who was hidden there came and lay with her. When we, in a corner of the garden, saw this crime, we ran toward them. We saw them lying together, but the man we could not hold because he was stronger than we. He opened the doors and ran off. Then we seized her and asked who the young man was, but she refused to tell us. We testified to this. The assembly believed them, since they were elders and judges of the people, and they condemned her to death. But Susanna cried aloud, O eternal God, you know what is hidden and are aware of all things before they come to be. You know that they have testified falsely against me. Here I am about to die, though I have done none of the things with which these wicked men have charged me. The Lord heard her prayer. As she was being led to execution, God stirred up the Holy Spirit of a young boy named Daniel, and he cried aloud, I will have no part in the death of this woman. All the people turned and asked him, What is this you are saying? He stood in their midst and continued, Are you such fools, O children of Israel, to condemn a woman of Israel without examination and without clear evidence? Return to court, for they have testified falsely against her. Then all the people returned in haste. To Daniel the elders said, Come, sit with us and inform us, since God has given you the prestige of old age. But he replied, Separate these two far from each other, that I may examine them. After they were separated one from the other, he called one of them and said, How you have grown evil with age. Now have your past sins come to term. Passing unjust sentences, condemning the innocent, and freeing the guilty. Although the Lord says, The innocent and the just you shall not put to death. Now then, if you were a witness... Tell me under what tree you saw them together. Under a mastic tree, he answered. Daniel replied, Your fine lie has cost you your head, for the angel of God shall receive the sentence from him and split you in two. 
Putting him to one side, he ordered the other one to be brought. Daniel said to him, Offspring of Canaan, not of Judah, beauty has seduced you. Lust has subverted your conscience. This is how you acted with the daughters of Israel, and in their fear they yielded to you. But a daughter of Judah did not tolerate your wickedness. Now then, tell me under what tree you surprised them together. Under an oak, he said. Daniel replied, Your fine lie has cost you also your head, for the angel of God waits with a sword to cut you in two, so as to make an end of you both. The whole assembly cried aloud, Blessing God who saves those who hope in him. They rose up against the two elders, for by their own words Daniel had convicted them of perjury. According to the law of Moses, they inflicted on them the penalty they had plotted to impose on their neighbor. They put them to death. Thus was innocent blood spared that day. The Word of the Lord. The Responsorial Psalm. The response is, Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In verdant pastures he gives me repose. Beside restful waters he leads me. He refreshes my soul. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side with your rod and your staff that give me courage. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. But early in the morning he arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. And Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin any more. The Gospel of the Lord. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, Bishop and Doctor. Quote, God is loving to man and loving in no small measure. 
For say not, I have committed fornication and adultery. I have done dreadful things, and not once only, but often. Will he forgive? Will he grant pardon? Hear what the psalmist says. How great is the multitude of your goodness, O Lord! Your accumulated offenses surpass not the multitude of God's mercies. Your wounds surpass not the great physician's skill. Only give yourself up in faith. Tell the physician your ailment. Say thou also, like David, I said, I will confess me my sin unto the Lord, and the same shall be done in your case, which he says immediately, and you forgave the wickedness of my heart. St. Cyril, Catechetical Lecture 2 Reflection When Constantine the Great legalized Christianity throughout the Roman Empire in the year 313, many were hopeful that the sufferings Christians had endured during the first few centuries of the Church had finally come to an end. But the sufferings only changed. Politics entered the Church, emperors inserted themselves into doctrine, and theological and territorial divisions became fierce. The theological divisions in the 4th century were primarily over the divine and eternal nature of the Son of God. Arius, a priest from Alexandria in North Africa, believed that the Father created the Son, making the Son subordinate to the Father and neither co-eternal nor co-equal with the Father. These teachings came to be known as the Arian heresy. Others believed that the Son was begotten of the Father, meaning he existed from all eternity with the Father, and was of the same divine nature. This theological battle was initially addressed in the year 325 at the Council of Nicaea. However, after the Council of Nicaea, the controversy continued until the confusion was finally settled in 381 by the Council of Constantinople. It was in this 56-year period of church history and controversy that today's saint was born, lived, and fought for the true faith. Cyril was born in or near the city of Jerusalem around the year 315 AD. Little is known about his early life, other than that he was well-educated in the scriptures and philosophy. It is believed that he was ordained a deacon for the Church of Jerusalem around the age of 20 by Saint Macarius, Bishop of Jerusalem, who was a staunch opponent of the Arian heresy. After Macarius died, Saint Maximus, another opponent of Arianism, became Bishop of Jerusalem and ordained Cyril a priest when Cyril was about 28 years old. During his priestly ministry, Cyril became a true shepherd of souls. He was entrusted by Bishop Maximus with the responsibility of assisting him as a preacher and catechist. Cyril preached every Sunday and catechized those preparing for the sacraments of initiation. A set of 24 of his catechetical instructions have been preserved and are remarkable for their content and clarity. The lectures begin with a prologue, followed by 18 lessons that were taught to the catechumens before they were baptized. The lessons explained what they needed to know about baptism, how to change from pagan morals, the meaning of the creed, and the errors of Arianism. Once baptized, Cyril's last six lessons led the neophytes through a period of mystagogy in which they were taught how to live the new life they received from the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and the most holy Eucharist, as well as lessons on prayer, especially found in the Lord's Prayer. Bishop Maximus either died or was deposed around the year 348, and Cyril was chosen to succeed him. He was ordained a bishop by Archbishop Acacius of Caesarea Maritima, from the Metropolitan See just west of Jerusalem. Archbishop Acacius was sympathetic to Arianism, so he and others might have believed that Cyril was also sympathetic to Arianism, which he was not. Soon after becoming the Bishop of Jerusalem, a miraculous sign, visible to all, appeared over the holy site of Jesus' crucifixion. A large cross of light, surrounded by a rainbow, appeared in the sky and stretched for about two miles over the city. This sign was initially perceived as God's affirmation of Bishop Cyril, but might have also been a sign of the suffering Cyril would soon endure. The suffering began as Cyril fought Acacius on two fronts. Bishop Cyril claimed the right of independent governance from Acacius in the Sea of Jerusalem. He also opposed the Arian heresy that Acacius taught. As a result of these tensions, Acacius, other Arian bishops, and emperors persecuted Cyril, leveled false accusations against him, and deposed and exiled him from Jerusalem three times during his almost 40 years as a bishop. Despite suffering through these theological and political church controversies, Bishop Cyril was a true shepherd of his flock, 
preaching and catechizing just as he had done as a priest. His gentle, pastoral, conciliatory, and humble approach to his ministry led some more orthodox bishops to suspect him of being sympathetic to the Arians. For that reason, after Cyril returned from his final exile in 378, the great Saint Gregory of Nazianzens was sent to investigate him. Gregory's conclusion was that Cyril was orthodox, which ended all doubt. In 381, the Council of Constantinople gave further clarity on the Arian heresy, further clarified the Creed of Nicaea, and affirmed Bishop Cyril's office of Bishop of Jerusalem. He returned and remained a holy shepherd of his people until his death six years later. One eyewitness visiting Jerusalem on pilgrimage wrote in her journal that Bishop Cyril's catechetical lessons were delivered in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and were so well received by the people that whenever he completed a lesson, all the people would enthusiastically applaud. Throughout the history of the Church, bitter divisions and the persecution of the Orthodox defenders of the faith have been prevalent. Those who emerged as saints were those who persevered, remained faithful, never despaired, and continued to spread the pure faith of the Church given to her by Christ. Saint Cyril was one of those shining examples. As we honor him, ponder your own commitment to the entire truth of the Gospel. When challenged, do you shy away, cower, become confused, and give in to despair? Or do you lovingly stand firm in the truth, retaining hope that, in the end, Christ will be victorious? Seek to imitate this great doctor of the Church by embracing not only his orthodoxy, but also the charity that fueled his zeal for souls. Prayer Saint Cyril, you are a loving shepherd and a firm defender of the truth of the divinity of Christ. You never wavered in your mission, not even during persecution and exile, but proclaimed Christ Jesus to your flock. Please pray for me, that I will always remain firm in my faith, especially when challenged by a hostile world, and will lovingly proclaim the truth to those who need it most. Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, pray for me. Jesus, I trust in you.